this video filmed on Ukraine Independence Day, where Sergei Starmer is standing on a field in Salisbury Plain. Behind him, British troops are trailing Ukrainian, Ukrainian soldiers, and you can hear, see tanks in the background, hear military shots from weapons. And it seems like there's nothing in this world that makes Sergei Starmer more proud than to stand on that field. He's rallying behind the British ruling class, condemning Russian aggression, and declaring his unshakable support for NATO. <laughs> Flag-waving patriotic Sergei Starmer takes every opportunity he can to express his love for NATO. He is of the opinion that NATO is a defensive alliance that never provoked any conflict in its history. And in this video, he announces that Britain together with its NATO allies are standing united <coughs> against Russian aggression. He emphasizes that the United Kingdom will never be politically divided on these questions. Sir Keir Starmer proudly stands hand in hand with the Tory government in his support for NATO who supposedly are fighting for peace, freedom, and democracy. Marxist, we are internationalists. We fight for an international socialist revolution that can overthrow the horror of capitalism. Marxists, therefore, can never be seen to take the side of any ruling class of any country at any point in time. We stand on the side of the working class all over the world. This is not out of any sentimental reason, but a practical one. Capitalism is an international economic system, so the fight for socialism must be international too. And this may seem like a very obvious principle, but many people within the labor movement, this principle goes straight out the window, especially when war breaks out. And we have seen this many times through history, especially when it comes to the question of NATO. And NATO paint uh, a very pretty picture about themselves of being non-aggressive, working for democratic values. But if you scratch on the surface, you will quickly realize that this is just a pretty picture. The many NATO wars, which has been carried out in the name of human rights, peace, democracy, shows the real nature of this alliance. The reality is that NATO is and has always been a brutal weapon of Western imperialism, especially US imperialism. So to understand why the United States needs such a tool, we need to understand imperialism itself. Lenin explained that imperialism is the highest and final stage of capitalism. It is based on the development of monopolies, where concentration and centralization of capital is in the hands of a few capitalists and banks. Imperialism is the naked domination of finance capital. And as capitalism developed, production expanded, the market within the nation state became too small, and the surplus of capital in the hands of monopolies and banks then began to be exported to other countries with the aim of making super profit. These capitalist countries then start to dominate the world by dividing up territories and markets. Imperialism is not just a evil idea, it's the logical development of capitalism. The historic role of capitalism was to create the means of production into giant monopolistic firms and to establish an interconnected capitalist world market. And today, with the concentrations of capital in a few key uh, monopolies and financial institutions, the capitalist nation state is very much interlinked with these private and state monopolies. And instead of having this so-called free market and free competition, you have national states backing monopolist interests in making profit. For example, Companies from the United States and China are dominating brand uh, finance global 500. Over two thirds of the total brand value in ranking is from these two countries. The US accounts for 49% of these values, 
China 19. The United States is the biggest economic power in the world. And obviously, America wants to keep it that way. And they have different tools that serve US imperialism. NATO is one of them. Because war is the natural outcome of imperialism and capitalism. Lenin explained that the cause of war in a modern epoch is a division of world competing imperialist nation states. Um, and, and conflict and war will inevitably erupt from the contradictions between these nation states' interests, which at the end of the day is the interest of finance capital. After World War II, the United States became the capitalist superpower on the planet. And one reason for that was that the United States had accumulated uh, super profits from the war production. And to further dominate the world market, the US pumped in huge amounts of money through the famous Marshall Plan into countries like Germany, Italy, and France. And they did so out of fear of the advancing Red Army, but also out of fear of uh, revolutions in Europe. The aim was to secure capitalism in Europe and to tie it closer to US imperialism. <laughs> and the distractions caused by the war meant that a huge reconstruction program in Europe was necessary. And this laid the basis for the biggest economic boom in history of capitalism. But just like the US, the Soviet Union also came out strengthened out of the war because they had been the main force of beating Nazi Germany. This meant that the entire course of international relationship was on one hand dominated by US imperialism and on the other Soviet bureaucracy. So the US find itself in need of a military alliance to fight the evil Russians. And on NATO's website, you can read the following. In 1949, the primary aim of the treaty was to create a pact of mutual assistance to counter the risk of that Soviet Union would seek to extend its control of Eastern Europe to other parts of the continent. I.e., NATO was founded as a weapon of US imperialism to fight the Cold War. It has remained a weapon ever since. Now, of course, it would be outrageous for NATO to openly uh, admit that they are a tool of US imperialism. So it has to be covered up in lies. And one of the main lies is that NATO is committed to the principle of individual liberty, democracy, human rights, the rule of law. And they repeatedly say that NATO is a defensive alliance who are committed to peaceful resolutions of disputes. <laughs> According to them, NATO has never started a war. Instead, they argue, if diplomatic effort fails, it has military power to undertake crisis management operations. <laughs> so if you were to believe what NATO says about themselves, you would think that they are a peace-loving, defensive alliance who's fighting for democracy. They even go so far that they say that they work for the women's cause and are engaged in the fight against climate change. But as I said earlier, you only need to take a quick look at NATO's war interventions, or what NATO likes to prefer it to call crisis management operations in Yugoslavia, Afghanistan, Libya, to see that their work for democracy is a complete lie. I don't think that any workers in these regions or these countries would agree that NATO bombing helped women there or implemented peace and democracy. The reality shows a complete opposite. Research from Brown University confirms that at least 929,000 people died directly due to the violence uh, in wars led by the US in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, Syria, and Yemen. And many times more have died indirectly to these wars due to the effect of malnutrition, damaged infrastructure, environmental integration. So, so, so much for human rights uh, and fighting climate change. These wars reveal the true face of US imperialism and NATO. It's a brutal killer machine. 
All these talks about human rights, non-aggression, crisis management operations are just empty words. NATO countries have shown countless times that they are ready to kill civilians, destroy whole regions to get control over territories. But since the war broke up in Ukraine, the question about NATO and its involvement has coming up. Um, and in order to defend themselves, NATO is answering uh, what they call myths about NATO. So for example, they say that it's, it's not true that NATO is at war with Russia in Ukraine, that NATO never promised Russia that they would expand after the Cold War. And they say it's just a myth that NATO is an aggressive threat to uh, Russia. But just let's take a look at the role that NATO has played in the war in Ukraine. Because even though they plead to be innocent, it is clear that the West using NATO have been provoking the conflict for their own imperialist interests. From the start, this war has never just been about Ukraine and Russia, but a proxy war about market and military territories uh, between Western allies and Russia. And this has been going on for many years, with the Russian uh, Ukrainian ruling class being divided and pulled in different directions. On the one hand, US imperialism, and on the other hand, towards Russia. This erupted in 2014, when the pro-Russian Yuvankovic regime was overthrown by a movement that was led and uh, that was supported by the US imperialism. And since then, NATO has been trying to keep Ukraine firmly under the influence of US imperialism and not allowing any Russian interference. Since 2014, Ukrainian military has been armed and trained by NATO countries. Earlier this year at the NATO summit in Madrid, it was uh, agreed that they would provide even more military help and support to Ukraine. Between 2014 and 2022, the US military aid to Ukraine amounted roughly to $3.5 billion. And since the war started, Ukraine has been granted more than $13 billion worth of military aid. And NATO countries, they see this as very well spent money because they don't, I mean, it's not because they care about Ukrainian people. US and Western imperialism only spend this money because they see Ukraine as key means of isolating Russia military and economically. The military support in itself won't put an end to the war. While the arms industries are looking towards super profits, the conflict is only being prolonged at the cost of millions of Ukrainians who are seeing their lives and homes being destroyed. But as I've said, NATO completely denies their involvement in the war. Instead, they argue that it was Russia that unprovoked attacked Ukraine. But this in itself doesn't explain anything. To find the root of the conflict, we have to go back to the time before uh, the collapse of the USSR. In the late 70s and early 80s, the Moscow bureaucracy had become a complete fetter of the Soviet Union, and it had been descending into crisis for several decades. But by the late 80s, Certain layers within the bureaucracy and the intelligentsia, they were moving towards a position towards support uh, of market economy. At the same time, you also had serious talk about unifications of East and West Germany. And by the late 80s, certain layers um, between, uh, um, yeah, no, sorry, Western capitalists then started to see basically that the possibility of having market economy in the region. For them, this was a massive opportunity of crushing the Soviet Union and opening the doors to more profitable markets in the whole Eastern Europe. And during this period, you have the Soviet U Union Military Alliance, the Warsaw Pact, that had their soldiers stationed out in Europe. And they were there as a guarantee against the Western attack, but also to secure the control of the Soviet bureaucracy. And to make sure that the Warsaw Pact did not intervene in the process of capitalism returning to Europe, the Soviet Union were given several promises by Western leaders that they would not threaten Soviet interests and securities. 
So Soviet Union leaders, they were led to believe that NATO would not expand in former East Germany or Eastern Europe. On the 1st of January 1990, the West German foreign minister, Genscher, said that in a speech, in order to not harm Soviet security interests, NATO should rule out expansion of its territory in the East, i.e. moving closer to the Soviet borders. One month later, the US Secretary of State, James A. Baker, promised Gorbachev that if Soviet Union accepted the new United <laughs> Germany, that they would join NATO, NATO would not expand one inch eastward. A treaty of Germany unification, signed by two German republics, Soviet Union, France, United Kingdom, United States, in November 1990, stated that the new German, uh, United German were free to join NATO, but no foreign troops would be stationed in Germany. Then the following year, just a few months before the Warsaw Pact ended, the John, John Mayer told Gorbachev that we are not talking about strengthening NATO. And on the question of NATO expansion, he said nothing on that sort will happen. Obviously, these promises were being broken a few years later. And this goes to show the value of promises made by representatives of the ruling class. Gentlemen's agreements are worthless. What really decides is the force on the ground, is the troops on the ground. And Putin, he has learned this from NATO. And with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, Russia became now a playground for oligarchs and Western finance capital. With the return of capitalism, Russia faced an even deeper crisis. For example, GDP fell 10% in 1991, and to tackle the crisis, President Yeltsin, who was the man who really opened up for capitalism in Russia, he asked West for aid and investment to help carry out his reform program. And Western finance experts, they estimated that what was needed to take Russia out from the crisis would amount between $76 billion to $167 billion each year for 15 years. But Western imperialism wanted to keep Russia and Eastern Europe economically weak. They, their plan was never to take Russia and Eastern Europe out of poverty, um, but to remain a weak region for US and Western imperialism to dominate. And in the end, Russia was only granted $6 billion to stabilize the ruble and a small loan of $24 billion from the IMF. And both Yeltsin and Putin relied heavily on the West to maintain their rule. The return of capitalism to this point meant that it was US dominance uh, over Russia. Moscow was being overrun by foreign businessmen and speculators. And this is really what imperialism looks like. After the fall of the USSR, US became the superpower in the world. It allowed uh, the US imperialism to intervene in former Soviet spheres of interest and um, American imperialism taking advantage of to start to see the Balkans, Yugoslavia, Iraq, places that they never dared to touch in the past. But it was not only US imperialism that had an interest in the East. Germany became a key player in the economy of Eastern and Central Europe and the Balkans. And they played a decisive role in the reactionary breakup of Yugoslavia. Sweden ramped up their investment in the Baltics. For instance, just two Swedish banks, SEB and Swedbank, now own more than half of the banking system in the Baltics. Eastern Europe industries began to buy up, um, no, Western Europe industry began to buy up Eastern <coughs> uh, For example, the German Volkswagen took over Skoda. But as the political and economic crisis in Europe, Russia developed, a split between the different wings of the Russian oligarchs began to occur. Because the Russian capitalists, they had their own interests, which did not necessarily coincide with the West. And when the Russian economy began to get on back on its feet in the early 2000s, the Western imperialists felt the need of procuring their interests in the region. <coughs> 
And in the years to come, the so-called defensive military alliance NATO revealed that they were an aggressive tool of US imperialism. In short order, it began from 1999 to 2004 uh, to incorporate most of the former Warsaw Pact into NATO. The inclusion in particular of the Baltic states brought NATO right up to the border of Russia. And if anyone has ever doubted NATO's aggressiveness, they can take a look at NATO's 78 days bombing of Yugoslavia and Serbia, which caused enormous economic damage and human rights. NATO not only intervened in a non-NATO country, but took sides against the Serbs, which were allies of the Russians, and they did so without a United Nations Security Council approval. And this was followed by interventions in Kosovo. And in The Independent, you can read about NATO's aggressiveness. They say, NATO promised to attack only military targets. And for as long as they thought they could crack the Serb military, that was what they did. But now they're doing just what the Americans did in Iraq 1991. Spreading the war to military targets, uh, to civilian targets, to bridges, to electricity stations, factories, with the excuse that they are also used for the military. The war in Yugoslavia and Kosovo proved Salma's claim that, never, uh, that NATO never provoked a conflict is a complete and utter lie. NATO then continues its uh, program of expansions. And these prov provocations really enraged the uh, military elite in Moscow because under Putin, things began to change. He represented a section of the state and the elite which wanted to stop the decline of Russians in world uh, relations. And demagogically, he appealed to the feeling of humiliations and hatred that the Russian masses felt towards the West for its conduct after the collapse of the USSR. And at the same time, in the early 2000s, the American was pushing even further to the near abroad of Russia and tried to incorporate the Ukraine and Georgia into NATO. Both of them border right up to Russia. And in the summer that took place in 2008 in Bucharest, both Ukraine and Georgia requested to join NATO. And from Moscow's point of view, this was one step too far, and they did not hesitate to use military power. Russian's army was sent into Georgia and Georgia was uh, swiftly crushed. And this intervention really revealed on one hand the limitations of US imperialism, but also Russia's growing confidence and power. So when Ukraine raised their aspirations of joining NATO, that did not go very well done with Russians. And let's do a little thought experiment of how the US would react in a similar situation. Let's say that China are forming an alliance in defense of peace and justice together with Cuba and Mexico. With the aim of having also including Canada. They start to invest millions of dollars in a pro-Chinese party inside Canada. That party lead an insurrection that results in the overthrow of Justin Trudeau's government. And this pro-Chinese party put themselves into power. Once in power, they began to ban American accents, start oppressing Americans, <laughs> and say that Canada, we have now aspirations of joining this Chinese military alliance. Then China start to place weapons, uh, station troops permanently, carry out exercises with over 30,000 soldiers right on the border to the US. What do you think would happen? Would Joe Biden just say, let it be, don't worry about it. <laughs> and countries like Canada are free to join any military alliance if they wishes to do so. Everyone has free will and you know, can do whatever they want. Uh, sovereignty for the Canadians. <laughs> And you can see, basically, that this, you would not let this happen. You can see how the US is reacting to foreign countries placing missiles close to home. For the US, the whole America is a no-go zone for other imperialist countries.
During the Cuban Missile uh, Crisis, the US threatened with nuclear war over the presence of Soviet missiles and troops on Cuba. And this little thought experiment is basically what happened in Ukraine in 2014. For years, the US have tried to influence politics in Ukraine and make it more friendly to the EU and uh, NATO. The US Assistant um, Secretary of State admitted having spent $5 billion since Ukraine went independent to get their policies implemented. But in the last decade, these, um, there has been a relatively decline of US imperialism. And in 2008, you started to see clear symptoms of, uh, of that, where, for example, the economic crisis, possible and unsuccessful war in uh, Afghanistan, Libya, Iraq, Syria. So with this relative decline of US imperialism, we have seen countries like Russia and China flexing their muscles. And when 2014 Crimea was joined up with Russia following the referendum, the US ruling class could do nothing but just raise their anger in words. The United States is, of course, the world, still the, the, the world's greatest economic and military power. Its annual military spending roughly equals the top 10 uh, countries combined. So on a world scale, uh, there's no power whatsoever that can challenge the United States. But on a regional level, the US can no longer claim to be the strongest power everywhere. And this was reflected in the last NATO summit in Madrid earlier this year, where they discussed the question of China. What worries the United States is that the potential dominance of economic uh, dominance of, of China, basically. And they also worried about Russia now becoming a closer ally to China in order to, what they say, uh, undercut rule-based international orders. And at the Madrid summit, countries like South Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand were invited. None of these countries are members of NATO. Inviting them is a provocative move against China. So all, again, again, all this talks about NATO being a purely defensive alliance, um, posing no threat whatsoever, it's just platitudes. The reason why NATO is raising this question about China it's because of, it is the main competitor of U.S. imperialism. Last week, Joe Biden he produced this document called the American Security uh, Strategy Document, where he outlined that Cuba is the most serious challenge facing them. Biden said that the U.S. is trying to fight countries like China and, and Russia, by, quote, investing in American power and influence, building strong coalitions to shape the global strategic environment, and strengthening the military to ensure it is equipped for an era of strategic competition with major powers. Biden then went on to say that the US would act to ensure that it was outcompeting China in the technological, economic, political, military intelligence and governs, uh, global governance domain. And this, all this, is a, this document is a very good description of what imperialism really is. And as Marxists, we can have no illusions whatsoever that NATO or ever uh, give our support uh, to this alliance, that we can have no illusion that they will ever bring about peace, um, democracy and so on. If we did um, say give illusions, we will be siding with American and Western imperialism. We will be siding with the Tory government and the British ruling class. The British working class interest has nothing to do with this. They are the ones who cry crocodile tears over Ukraine and Ukrainian uh, migrants. The ruling class and the Tory party, well, they don't care about Ukrainian whatsoever. Britain, together with the US, were the ones who were ramping up the conflict in the first place. Because, as you remember, the war had a very convenient effect of cutting across the scandals that Boris was facing at home at the time, with the party gate scandals. Tracked workers from the problems at home. And now the government is aiming to show that they are the most loyal members of NATO, 
spending more def- uh, money on defense. Let's trust. She said earlier this summer that the 2% of GDP on the bench should be the floor, not the roof. At the same time, they turn a blind eye to the bad migrants from Africa and Middle East who are fleeing wars and conflicts caused by Western imperialism and NATO interventions. So to not side with the ruling class should be crystal clear for anyone who say that they are acting on the interests of the working class. But instead, we see many examples where that has not been the case. Take Sir Keir Starmer, for example, who said that to condemn NATO is to condemn the guarantee of democracy and security it brings. He even threatens to kick out uh, MPs who has a position against NATO from the party. Now, it's not very surprising that this comes from Sir Keir Starmer. He's, after all, an agent of the, the class. What might have surprised a few people on the left were the fact that social democracies in Finland and Sweden and decided to apply for NATO membership. These countries have for years been holding up this act of being neutral and keeping away from conflict, especially Sweden, who's been bragging that we have not been in war since 1814. Um, but the truth is that Sweden is not very peaceful as they say they are. While Swedish imperialism is too small to play any significant role in war interventions, their main role has been to export weapons to those wars. Last year, Sweden sold most of their weapons to United Emirates, who are at the moment killing the Gemini people. Sweden, uh, the Swedish imperialists, they have their own reason of why they want to join NATO, as they are advancing their financial interest in the Baltics. And by formally joining NATO, they can have a certain influence over this alliance and, and, and defend basically their interests and profits in the region. So with the invasion of Ukraine, it has been a massive propaganda campaign to rally Swedes behind the Swedish, European and American imperialism. They have deliberately also ramped up the already ongoing anti-Russian propaganda and claiming that Putin, he's going to invade Sweden by taking over Gotland Island in the Baltic Sea. This is, of course, outrageous. Uh, it won't happen. But the real aim is really to scare the workers into a membership of NATO. Earlier this year, you had the social democracies, uh, democratic leaders in Sweden and Finland had a meeting where they discussed the question of NATO membership. And present at this meeting was the head of the, the, the families in Sweden, the main capitalist family in Sweden, Jakob Wallenberg, who owns SAB, which is the biggest Swedish exporter of arms. This family also owns the bank SEB, which I mentioned before has major interest in the Baltics. So it makes it very clear that under bourgeois democracy, it is the finest capital that dictates the politics. The social democratic government uh, has been studying faithfully behind the Swedish ruling class. They are the party who was leading Sweden into NATO, sending arms to Ukraine and increasing their military spending to 2% of the GDP. And this is, of course, a complete betrayal by Swedish leaders of the workers' movement, who ends up defending their own bourgeoisie and Western imperialism. And as you might remember, Turkey wanted to use the situation to strike a blow against the Kurdish struggle. In order for Sweden and Finland to join NATO, Turkey wants Sweden and Finland to give them full support against the threat of its national security, i.e. they want to have Sweden and Finland giving them full support to Erdogan to brutally oppress the Kurds. And this is very ironic that NATO is being portrayed as this alliance against oppressive, autocratic, ruthless regime in Russia. These same ladies and gentlemen are blissfully content that one of their own key members in NATO, uh, Turkey, are in prison, torturing and killing the Kurdish people. It is scandalous that these leaders of the labor movement is giving Turkey a hand of oppressing the Kurds in order to join NATO. And this shows the upper hypocrisy on the one hand by the Labour leaders, but also by Western 
uh, leaders uh, of imperialism, and it shows their true aims. We can have no illusion whatsoever that NATO will bring peace, human rights, democracy. Um, you have people like, for example, NATO defender Paul Mason, who calls himself a Marxist, um, but he always ends up on the side of imperialism and the British ruling class. And he's, you know, he says we need to strengthen NATO, but we need to also make it so it's more democratic. So he put forward a program for it. Um, it is laughable, really, to think that you can reform the, the weapon of US imperialism to become a defender of democracy. But Marxists don't just say no to NATO. Our slogan doesn't end with abolish NATO. In the last analysis, NATO is just a cover for US and Western imperialism. Trump, a couple of years ago, you might remember, he threatened to pull out of NATO. Will that mean the end of US dominance and Western alliance uh, military? No, probably not. They will just find another way to defend their interests, maybe for United Nations or something like that. To fight um, NATO means fighting against imperialism and capitalism. And Marxists, we are not pacifists. We don't just abstractly are against war. For example, you have people like Jeremy Corbyn and Sotter War Coalitions, who calls for negotiations and diplomatic solutions. And saying that war is unnecessary, we just need to gather around the table and come to an agreement. <clears throat> but no diplomatic solutions is ever going to be able to stop the real cause and the underlying cause for war, which is capitalism. As I mentioned before, these gentlemen's agreements are completely worthless. They don't change any of the contradictions of war in the first place. <laughs> Pacifism calls for inaction, and you cannot fight for peace by doing nothing. So at the end of the day, pacifism ends up defending imperialism. <clears throat> for us, it will never be the question of taking one side of the ruling class against another. The war in Ukraine is a reactionary imperialist war on both sides, one of Russia and one of NATO. For Ukraine, NATO will never bring peace, and imperialist peace will only continue by war of other means, in turn prepare for future war in the future. The real alternative is to struggle against imperialism and to overthrow capitalism, and that's why we say no war but class war. Our starting point must always be the class question. This task is to uh, expose the hypocrisy of the ruling class, especially our own capitalist class. The main enemy is at home. The best way to help the working class in countries like Ukraine, Libya, Syria, is to take up the struggle against our own bourgeoisie and call the workers of the world to do the same against their own ruling class. The struggle for imperialism, against imperialism, of course, and capitalism, must therefore be based on international working class solidarity and a program for socialist revolution.